This has been the big question throughout this series, the series hosted by the Oxford Prospects and Global Development Institute. In the series of conversations that we've had, we have partnered academic speakers and audiences from the UK and China, and we do the same again today. In this fourth and final conversation of the series, I'm very pleased to present our three panelists. Firstly, Professor Chumin Chi received his PhD at Tsinghua University. Currently, he is the Professor of the Department of History and Dean of Degree at the School of Humanities at Tsinghua University. Professor Chi is an expert in the history of the Qing Dynasty and the Republic in China. His research interest is the making of modern China, focusing on the contribution of Chinese classical learning in modern times and the formation of modern discipline in China. Professor Chi, it's really good to have you join us from your base there in China. Professor Chi, I should say, is also a prize winner of national excellent doctoral dissertation in 2005 and has numerous publications. Two books, one, The Study of Yanfu Lectures on Politics, and another, A Study of Ruan Huan's Draft History of Collected Biographies of Confucians. Perhaps we shall hear a little more later of your interest in Confucian studies. And to our second panelist, Dr. Mamtimin Sun Nuadala, is head of the East Asia Chun Chinese Studies Department at the Bodleian Library here in the University of Oxford. He has strategic oversight for developing the Bodleian Library's resources and services in Chinese, Japanese, and Korean studies and curatorial responsibility for Bodleian's Chinese rare books and special collections, some of which we shall see. Dr. Suno Dulas has published widely also on the role of language as a social practice in negotiating ethnic and social identities and its effect on the wider social relations of power in the context of multilingual China. And thirdly, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Emily Burgoyne. Emily, like the two other panelists, is also a historian. Emily is the librarian with strategic oversight of the historic Angus Library and archives. Angus is the leading collection worldwide for Baptist history and heritage. It holds the leading collection of papers from many Baptist figures from the 18th century and beyond and other documents conversing mission fields from 1792 onwards. We shall hear a little more of that when we turn to Emily, but welcome to all three of our panelists. I should just say, um, in case you wonder who this person is that's talking to you, my name is Myra Blythe. Um, I have been a tutor at Regent's Park College where the Angus is based for many years. And my interest is in the interdisciplinary study of theology and justice. So we come to our discussion today where we will reflect on the challenges which COVID-19 has highlighted and explore the prospects for overcoming those challenges of uncertainties by drawing the experience and legacy of history into our view. Especially we'll look at the last 300 years when in times of political and economic uncertainty, pioneering individuals, including missionaries, worked in areas such as public health, education, cultural and linguistic dialogue with the outcome of building intercultural exchange and mutual understanding. So we want to draw from those stories today to see what inspiration and strategies we might find as we look with hope to beyond COVID-19 with the arrival of the vaccine. To put our conversation in context, and for the benefit of those of you that have never had the opportunity to visit either the Angus Library or the Bodleian, I want to, to turn fairly, firstly to Emily and then to um, Mamti to just give us a very brief introduction into what the resources are that you supervise and look after, which visitors to your archives might find, especially in relation to Anglo-Chinese relations. Emily, please, the Angus Library. 
Thanks very much, Myra. Um, hello, everybody. It's really great to be here today. I'm Emily Burgoyne. I am the library of uh, I am the librarian of the Angus Library and Archive, um, based here in Oxford at Regent's Park College. Um, we have a world-leading collection of Baptist and non-conformist history, not just about Britain, but about the, the world, wherever there's been a Baptist presence generally. Um, we have 70,000 items in the library dating back to the 15th century. We have a really interesting collection of artifacts, uh, photographs, journals, uh, manuscripts, and uh, text, uh, texts as well, printed material. Um, usually when there isn't a global pandemic, we have over a hundred visitors from around the world every year and, and many more inquiries. Um, at the moment, unfortunately, we're closed to visitors. We're also the official repository for the Baptist Missionary Society or the BMS. Uh, this was an organization that was established in the late 18th century. Um, the first mission post was in Serampore in India. Um, they set up a, a mission press uh, to create revenue for the missionaries, but they also translated and printed many, many um, early uh, texts, such as uh, a translation of the Bible into Bengali, Hindustani. We have many of their early uh, translations and prints in the library, I'm very happy to say. One of the earliest missionaries, Joshua Marshman, who I'll be talking a little bit more about today, um, began to learn Chinese in 1805. Um, he was taught by a gentleman named Johannes Lassar. And over the next 20 years or so, they worked together on many important Anglo-Chinese translations. Uh, one of the first translations of Confucius into English in 1809, the Apostles of St. John, uh, Matthew and Mark, um, elements of Chinese grammar, which is a kind of a, a Chinese um, uh, a language learning book. And they uh, completed the first translation of the Bible, um, a full complete version in 1822. So we have copies of these very important Anglo-Chinese texts in the uh, Angus. And we also have a number of other very important texts such as Robert Morrison's uh, first uh, translation of the Bible into Chinese from 1823 many of his other books, such as a uh, Chinese miscellany um, and his work on the Canton dialect. We have many more Anglo-Chinese texts, um, dictionaries, lexicons and grammars. We also have a really great um, collection of manuscript letters. These are really interesting because they give an eyewitness account of life in China from the late 19th century onwards, written by the, the men and the women who are missionaries um, living and working in China one of whom was Timothy Richard, who I'll also be talking about later today. Timothy Richard was a very important figure in Baptist mission history and also uh, in, in Chinese educational reform. We have a great collection of his tracts and also his manuscript letters. Um, and we have a, a really interesting collection of photographs and glass slides taken by missionaries, again, from the late 19th century onwards, chronicling life, uh, many places, subject, topics, all kinds of things in China. So we have a very interesting Anglo-Chinese collection. Thank you, Emily. I hope that whets the appetite of those who've not had a chance to visit the library before now. And we turn now to Dr. Sunu Adula um, to hear a little bit about the Bodleian collection. Um, thank you very much, Myra. Um, I think I'll probably just start and I probably won't give um, an overview of what we have because we have so, so such a vast amount of <laughs> things of interest, but I'll probably tell you a kind of little story and you know, how Bodleian started um, getting interested in Chinese. Um, I think the Bodleian is probably the earliest, one of the earliest, if, if not the earliest library to, 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 be, to get interested and to bought a Chinese book. Um, and that kind of, just give you the first Chinese book, I can show you the um, image of it, and probably could, we could visualize. Um, okay. Can you see the screen? Okay. Yes, that's great. Yeah, but it, it, it seems upside down in Chinese. <laughs> that's right that's right that's yeah okay see, yeah. that's what i'm going to tell you a little bit about and why it's upside yeah. down yeah um so the 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 bodleian is interested yeah. in chinese um uh in um 
very early and this is uh, in the, bo the book bought in 1604. You could see that on the right hand side um, what is written. It says uh, donated by Henry Percy. Um, yeah. the, the money is donated by Henry Percy. Oh, yeah. Henry Percy is a uh, count or uh, Duke of Northumberland and the book is purchased in 1604. Oh, yeah. So this is a uh, handwriting, handwritten by Thomas Bodley. The, you know, oh. the Bodleian's name. Um, the Bodleian, oh. his, Bodley himself bought this book himself in 1604. The Bodleian Library is um, founded in 1602. So two years later, there is a Chinese book. So I think this, uh, you could say that the, 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 the Bodleian is um, academic interest by librarians is much, dates much earlier than any academic interest by ac the professional academics. Um, the, the, the Oxford appointed its first Chinese professor in 18, 1875 and, uh, and, and the Britain sent its first ambassador to China, the mission in 1793. And, and the China sent its first ambassador to Britain in 1876. So if you think about these dates, um, in terms of the, the diplomatic relations with China and, and the, 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 the professorship was, which was established in Oxford, the Bodleian predates that by about 200 years, two centuries. Um, and then and the, the other, um, the dates. Um, um, the reason that why it's upside down is that um, nobody knew what this is. So the book started from right to left um, to turning from other side. And this is treated like an a, a English book. And so a, a Western book or a Latin book at that time, perhaps. So the, Thomas Bodley has written this there. Um, so that's why it's upside down because nobody knew what he was buying. So he bought it. I really admire this. I, I wish I could do that. I, I probably probably should do that. And that I, I try to find something that I can't read. I don't know what it is. I'm just buy it. Um, so this book we still have it, and since 1604, and that's um, 416 years. And we I I we I look after this book, and it's very precious for us. And there are many lot of Chinese visitors they come and they, I'll show them the, this tells you a very interesting story. So what happened after that? Uh, Thomas Bodley and his pre and successors um, continued to buy Chinese books. They didn't, nobody knew any Chinese in, in Britain, whole of Britain. There was no record of anybody arriving from China who, you know, to, in, in any record. And so there was, um, in 18, uh, well, 1687, um, the word uh, spread that a Chinese person has arrived in London via uh, Europe, um, Rome and, and Belgium. And um, so this is a Chinese person called Shen Fuzong, uh, Michael Shen in English. He was given the Michael Shen as and he was brought by Jesuits. Um, so he was, sort of become a superstar, star, super, superstar. He knew, he, nobody knew him in China. There wasn't the record you could trace back his, his roots, apart from his written things when he was here, where he was from. He was from Nanjing. Um, so he met many people, the kings and queens, and he was invited to meet uh, King James of England at that time. Um, so when he, King James invited him to come to stay in his palace, um, he, the, he saw inviting from someone from Oxford, Oxford being the center of uh, royal learning. Um, so he invited somebody uh, to come and to interpret for him. And this is Shen Fuzong who arrived um, so in 1687 in London. And this is actually in, in King's Palace. His, he was, uh, his portrait was painted by King's uh, painter who painted portrait for the King. When he was uh, staying with King James II in his palace, 
And this was uh, recorded that um, King has put this portrait by his bedchamber, so he could see it every day going out in, uh, from his, his room. Um, so this is him. And, and then the, when he arrived and nobody speaks, spoke any Chinese, nobody knew what they were, they were doing or what, you know, anything about China, anything close to they can get to China apart from the Bodleian people who got the book. <laughs> But they, nobody knew what the book is. Um, and then, and this man uh, came into the picture. He was uh, the new professor of, Laudian professor of Arabic and Semitic languages. And also they happened to be the Bodley's uh, librarian, the librarian of the Oxford University. So the king thought, or the, his, his, uh, his, uh, his, his secretary thought that, this will be a good fit that he would uh, know some Oriental Eastern languages and he could translate for the king <laughs> from Chinese into, uh, into Latin or English. Um, so this is what happened. And then um, he met uh, Thomas Hyde and, and Shen Fuzong met uh, in, at the banquet given by the king. Um, um, Thomas um, um, Hyde has invited um, Shen Fuzong to come to Oxford because by that time in 1687, the Bodleian had about 82 Chinese books that nobody knew but continue to buy or being donated to us. And we have all, all these books that just recorded at that time by Shen Fuzong, um, except one. Um, so we took good care of these books and, and people still have access and tells you a very nice story. Um, so what happened when Shin arrived and, and Shin actually came to Oxford and he was, um, he was here for in Bodleian for uh, six, um, just under seven weeks. And he started to explain, and this is on the right way around now. <laughs> um, he started to explain these books and you could see his handwriting. That's his handwriting. And he was explaining this, uh, what this is and Sushu, yeah, that's yeah. in Latin and Confucian, you know, the, in, I think the Portuguese, this, this character X pronounced as sh, isn't it? So, the, yeah. so Sushu. So at that time, uh, this is, is written and then you could see the translation here. Thank you, Mungi, the, very much. Um, can we can, can we, we just... take it up from here and perhaps come back to some of your pictures at a later point? That's fine. Um, because following Shen Fu Tsung, many have come to visit, yeah. and our panelist, Professor Chi, was perhaps one of the most recent of the visitors to Oxford when he met with yourself in the Bodleian and also looked quite deeply into the documents in the Angus Library. So perhaps we can turn to you, Professor Chi, at this point and ask you to help us to understand from your perspective, the challenges that COVID-19 might have presented um, for you in China, um, as we will also be able to share how it's affected us. But I want you particularly to take time to explain why you believe that the paths and the strategies forged by pioneers such as missionaries and such as the people that um, Emily and Mamte have referred to, why the paths that they forged um, deserve more attention. As a historian, you are looking very much into the Qing dynasty as well as modern China. Um, what are the particular paths that these people forged? Um, and which people do you have in mind when you say they need to have more of our attention? Over to you. Thank you. Uh, I prepare uh, and I share with you my, yeah. Oh, is that okay? Yep. Okay, thank you, yeah. Uh, after a, a nearly a year of a hard time, I would rather have a cup of tea with M with Emily, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 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 
in China, the border is very famous. You know, uh, our alumni, our predecessor, Professor Qian Zongsu, has started uh, has, uh, in, uh, in Oxford. Yeah. And uh, he loved to uh, borrow books and, and read them in the uh, library board. And he gave the board a uh, name, you know? Uh, he say that the, the name in China, yeah, the board is uh, folk warm, you know? Uh, folk warm is full. <laughs> I think, yeah, I just see the pictures. Yeah. I uh, know that it, be, it will be happy uh, for me to be uh, to tend to a uh, bookworm in library for them <laughs> today. But uh, it's a big yeah. It's a it's time to talk about a big problem. You know, uh, I'm very happy to attend this uh, meeting. You know, uh, COVID nine changed everything. COVID-19 changed everything, yeah. I think it's not only an epidemic, you know, but also a crisis uh, of ideological, you know. It's not that there are indeed, for me, uh, many uh, misunderstandings uh, on basic value between Western uh, and China, you know, especially, I think, uh, including uh, Great Britain. Uh, you know, uh, there are many measures to preventing the epidemic. You know, you see the lockdown of Wuhan for several months, and uh, uh, everyone uh, simply in China wear masks, and uh, everything uh, is hard. I think there are um, there are around many disputes uh, about this measure. No, I think behind this, there lies a big problem. Uh, since there are many, I think, misunderstanding mm, on the basic value of human society uh, between China and Great Britain. Yeah. Uh, I have to uh, pay a visit uh, to a uh, region and <laughs> yeah, to check the archive mm, uh, last uh, November. I miss the time. It's a good time. Uh, uh, but academic give me a new look uh, on this account. And I think we are on a way to after, after way, yeah, after history of a mutual understanding. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, uh, some people, yeah, many people have come here before, yeah. But we found uh, a new look. And uh, you know, uh, I see pictures of a marshman yeah, hand on the wall yeah, on the region's park, and many people uh, do many work, yeah, uh, do great deal uh, to promoting the mutual understanding between China and uh, Great Britain. And uh, the first, I think, is marshman, yeah. Uh, you can see the picture. Yeah, it's a it's a first Chinese uh, version that translate of a Bible translate from English uh, from English uh, to uh, Chinese, and uh, it is all uh, it has been studied by uh, many people. <laughs> I have seen the dissertation. Uh, they uh, do a great job, but uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, the Marshman uh, translated. Uh, just as you talk about Si Shu, uh, uh, is a Da Xue, uh, by Zhu Zi, uh, to, uh, into English. Yeah. And, uh, and also the Confucius, work of Confucius, Confucius uh, part of it uh, translated into uh, English. Uh, we will talk about later. Yeah. And, uh, uh, here are the, uh, some pages you can see. Uh, uh, actually, uh, it's very interesting that the accent yeah, is the Canton, Cantonese. You know, uh, maybe in, in England, you may see many Cantonese. They say when the Chinese New Year comes, they say, 
Gong Hei Fast Hai. <laughs> but actually, uh, it's Cantonese. It's Cantonese. Accent is Cantonese. Uh, uh, there are Mandarin, uh, you know. Uh, and uh, you see the pictures? Yeah, there's a dissertation on the Chinese language uh, in front of uh, uh, the Confucius. Yeah. And uh, uh, it's something uh, I think. Uh, not so good for uh, nowadays, yeah. And uh, later, uh, several years later, he published another his dissertation on Chinese grammar, uh, elements of the Chinese grammar. But you see, he changed the the, uh, the accent. Yeah. Uh, he found that it seems that he knew there are many uh, dialects, say Guanghua, uh, Mandarin. Yeah, and uh, the pronunciation is changed. Yeah, and uh, there's Morrison, yeah, and his uh, translation of the Bible is well known. You know. And uh, uh, another his work is famous. Very, uh, is very famous is the dictionary, and the first uh, English Chinese dictionary. You know, uh, it's known to all. And uh, there, Timothy Richard, Timothy Richard. Yeah, it's very famous too. Uh, this is a picture I take in the Angus Library. You know, it's it's an advertisement to call people uh, make a, uh, uh, to make a prime mission. Yeah, it's a it's a, a Timothy Richard in Chinese. You see, in Sanxi Province. Yeah, in about eighteen eighteen. Yeah, he called people to. Make a fine mission according to this uh, to this map, yeah. But uh, uh, another thing is that he trans the he translated the Chinese novel, famous novel, Xi Yu Ji, uh, a mission to heaven, the Monkey King. Uh, it's the first, uh, it's the first version, yeah, uh, in English, you know. And uh, uh, some pictures, yeah. And uh, oh, it's. Uh, it's Williamson. It's very, uh, yes, it's impressive. Yeah, impressive. Yeah. Uh, he is later the president for the, uh, yeah, uh, the Baptist Church of England in 1950s. And I see many his manuscripts. Yeah. And, uh, but he, uh, this is his dissertation and for his, the, uh, uh, Literature, uh, doctor literature, uh, it's it's very famous too. It's a study and uh, on Wang Anshi, uh, a famous writer, uh, uh, also a statesman, educationist. Uh, he translated uh, about eighty uh, eight articles of Wang Anshi into Chinese, uh, into English. Yeah, and uh, this is a book real, and uh, this is a map. In his yeah, I think I think yeah, also uh, in the library. Yeah. Uh, all these people have done their uh, yes, I think uh, promote the uh, mutual uh, culture, yeah, mutual understanding between China and uh, uh, Great Britain. Now, I it seems I have much to say, but the uh, time is limited. It's up, you know. I. I Thank you, stopped. Professor Chi. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is this is helping us to step forward. Thank you very much indeed. Maybe we can ask our two archivists to respond um, to what you've described in in these accounts of different individuals. Um, Emily could maybe say a little bit more about the individuals you've mentioned, and uh, Dr. Mamti, maybe you could express a little bit from your expertise in the area of translation and linguistics, why it's important to invest such time and energy into that kind of exercise in the works that you've been showing us and others that you have. So maybe, Emily, just say a little bit more about Marshman perhaps and, and, and the other characters. So I think that um, Marshman is, is really interesting just um, to use as a kind of an example of, of um, somebody who sort of mirrors our experience now working in the middle of, of COVID in times of uncertainty. 
Um, I think that we sometimes forget the story behind certain texts, you know, all the work that went into producing um, uh, material. I mean, I can get a, a copy of the works of Confucius from the shelf in the Angus, and I can look at it and consider uh, how important it is historically and how beautiful it is aesthetically. But I don't necessarily have to give much time uh, thinking about all the difficulty that went into actually producing it you know, the environment in which it was actually produced. Um, Marshman had to deal with a lot of barriers, a lot of opposition to what he was doing. He wasn't working in a particularly friendly uh, environment to, to missionary activity. And yet he, he sort of um, held on to his vision and he managed to achieve it. So for example, he embraced a new kind of technology. Traditionally at that time, uh, a lot of Chinese print was being done with, with woodblock printing. Um, and uh, that was sort of seen as the traditional way. Robert Morrison very much advocated that that was used to print books at that time. But from about 1811 onwards, the missionaries using the mission press um, thought about how they were going to advance their printing using the, the printing press at Serampore. And they started to use movable metal type. And in fact, the Bible, the, the complete translation of the Bible was entirely printed using movable metal type. And that was a really big advance in technology for them using that at the mission press. And I think that it's really interesting when we're talking today about having to um, embrace a completely different kind of technology and a new way of doing things. You can compare that directly, I think, straight back to Marshman, Lassar, the people that he was working with. The fact that they had to uh, embrace a different way of disseminating their ideas and having cultural exchange. And I think we can say the same thing about Timothy Richard. Uh, Timothy Richard went out to China in 1870. Um, and I think he went very much in the capacity of being a traditional missionary, of using uh, traditional methods of getting his ideas across. So preaching and um, itinerating. And I think he realized pretty quickly that he wasn't going to be able to have much of a cultural exchange if he um, proceeded like that. So he became far more receptive and open-minded to the beliefs and the culture around him. He immersed himself in important uh, Chinese works of literature, Buddhist works, Taoist works, Confucian works. Um, and he decided that he was going to use the written word as a, as a medium of, of, of cultural exchange, of talking to people, of trying to spread his ideas of reform. And this was a big departure from, from how missionaries had behaved in the past. So he was giving lectures to people, to scholars, to officials, and he was talking about science. He was talking about uh, modern subjects, agronomy and astronomy. And he was also the editor of a, of a newspaper for a time, Shibao. And he was using that as a platform for his reformist ideas. He was using a very different kind of journalism and um, publishing uh, graphs, statistics to try and show his readers where China was in comparison to other nations at that time. And he also became secretary of the SDK, which was uh, the Society for the Diffusion of Knowledge uh, in China. And he used that as a platform to, to have cultural exchange. He oversaw the printing of thousands of texts and books about many different subjects, not at all just Christianity, but peace, um, harmony with other nations, um, modern economic reform, educational reform as well. And he made sure that these works were distributed to many people that he thought might be sympathetic to his ideas. And he made sure that there were a number of depots set up across provincial um, capitals to, to sell his books at depots. And he experienced a lot of opposition because he'd had this departure from traditional methods of being a, a missionary. I think he described himself at one point as the only missionary employed entirely in, in a literary capacity because he, he was using literature so much to get his ideas across, you know, writing his tracts and giving his lectures. And I think, again, you know, we can learn from that today that he was prepared to encounter hostility and opposition to what he was doing but he believed so much in his vision that, that he forged a new way. And I think that's very much what we're having to do in the times of COVID. We're having to embrace new technology, different ways of communicating ideas and learn from each other. I also think they're really uh, interesting as examples of international collaboration, which is very much what we're having to do today, what we're doing to now in this conversation, learning from each other, having cultural exchange. 
So if you look at the works of Marshman, for example, yeah. his translation works were truly international collaborations. He was working with Lassar, Lassar was Armenian. Uh, they, the only medium of language I think, I believe that they could speak through was Portuguese. Uh, I don't think Lassar could speak any English. Yeah. Then they yeah. were working with many um, Chinese contributors. Yeah huge amount of Chinese contributors, a lot of them at the moment still quite uncredited, we're still learning about, about who helped Marshman and Lassar. And of course, they were also overseeing Bengali craftsmen uh, who, who were carving out the, the printing types. So that's an incredible um, collaboration where everybody's learning from each other's culture, craftsmanship experience. And I think that's very much what we're doing today, you know, international collaboration going forward. And Richard did exactly the same, you know, um, his vision of establishing higher education institutes across China, he could not have, have, have started to spread those ideas. He could not have um, overseen with the help of others, the establishment of the Shanxi University without collaboration from many people, from many different cultures, people from other missions, many people in China who were very sympathetic to his reform ideas. So also he was collaborating with many people, you know, he saw that he couldn't do this alone. And I think that we're all working in cultural institutions now in this time of COVID and uncertainty. And we very much also, I think, know that we can't do this on our own. You know, we have to help each other. We have to look at the examples that, that other people are using to, to reach out to people so that, so that we can still all access cultural institutions. So I think we can learn a lot from Marshman and Timothy Richard. Thank you, Emily, very much indeed. Yeah. Um, can, I, can I turn now to, to Dr. Sunu Adula and ask whether you could continue to draw from resources from the Bodleian, where we can again learn this lesson of strategies and methods by those in the past, which can perhaps inspire us to do it differently today. Um, you're muted. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you. I, I, I was just um, looking at um, Professor Chi's slides and then I realized the, the Marshman's work and the translated work actually existed in Bodleian. And the first book we bought is actually, it's a su yeah. su shu, and you know, it, it was translated by him. That is just, um, Professor Chi just showed the pictures of 200 years later. And we also, um, the other book that he, he showed is the, the, uh, the, the, the Chinese novel, um, the, the water margins. Um, that was also uh, acquired in the kind of one of the earliest acquisitions. I just wondered that if uh, Marshman or had any, any contact in, you know, had opportunity to go to see this in the Bodleian went before <clears throat> he, Maybe it, that inspired them to to look at these things. And I, on the other hand, it's kind of these are seen as essential works in Chinese society and culture. So it's probably that's why um, he has concentrated on these things. So just going back to the the exchanges that I just want to um, um, to talk about, I think it just gives us a little bit more about what happened then and how, what can you know. What happened in the past can inspire us to move forward uh, in, in today's um, situation. Um, just to share my rest of the slides, and just I don't have that many, um, probably okay. I'll explain a little bit. Yeah. As you can see, now this is the rule explained by Shen Fuzong in 1687. Yeah. To Thomas Hyde. Um, and this is printed in, um, in uh, mostly in um, most of our early acquisitions came from Fujian um, in, um, from the coastal areas that the Chinese merchants went to, migrated to Southeast Asia and, and then the the Dutch merchants of East India Company bought this and brought it back to Europe and sold it in auctioned off in in, in Amsterdam. So this is where it was bought. Um, 
so this was explained to to Thomas Hyde and what it is, and they they made a list of it, and they have uh, Thomas has also learned Chinese from uh, Shen Fuzong, and there was very interesting discussions between Shen and Hyde, which is involves wine and food and uh, and the various um, social aspects of life in different you know both countries. Um, he was also introduced to this um, the Chinese medicine, <laughs> which is yeah. probably relevant to what we are thinking yeah. now and the, the learning about Medicaid medicine and introducing each other's medicine. And this is um, slightly wrong. I think that if you look at the book title, this is kind of uh, Shin Fuzong's writing explaining what it is um, and on the, the cover. Well, if you look at the book, it's... it's um, um, Easier, it's medicine, and the other one it says, uh, Sorry, how do I go back to this? Previous, that's right. Mm -hmm. Well done. Um, so I go back to this, and it says, This is the Jia, which is a, a, a family, uh, Yijia means yeah. them, doctors, and then the other one is. Um, um, medicine. So this is an introductory text for medicine. So that's what um, he was introduced. And then during the exchanges, then they, they had a, such a deep impression of each other within that seven week. And this is what they've written um, about each other. And this is uh, Shin Fuzong writing about, uh, Thomas Hyde writing about Shin Fuzong. And he was yeah. saying that Shin Fuzong is a scholar. He was, he was, he was uh, fluent in his culture and language. And he's also a very um, reliable and honest person. Um, and he, he was very, you know, so very, very complimentary. And then there was also have the um, Shin Fuzong uh, uh, saying uh, things about Thomas Hyde before he arrived. He was very impressed by uh, Thomas Hyde's attitude, or well, the, 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 the Bodleian's um, you know, way of sharing the books and his library. Uh, with all any scholars that's interested. So this is kind of perhaps new to Shin Fuzong. That's not a, uh, a practice in China that you have a library that publicly available to scholars. So this kind of, and, and just want to go back to um, a couple of uh, slides that just show you what, um, Yeah, and Thomas Hyde, this is his, um, is, is an important person and he's kind of librarian, also the professor. He didn't know Chinese before Shin arrived. And then when he drew, somebody painted his picture, you know, the, the, the um, portrait and he had a Chinese scroll. He's written the Chinese characters there. So it sort of, he, the, the Shin has left a deep impression in Thomas and that's kind of started uh, a long intellectual curiosity and I think uh, uh, which continues um, you know up until now about learning about each other's culture and um, there are two things that I think and I want to highlight and one is uh, the the knowledge um, uh, that Thomas Hyde is admiring that knowledgeable res showing respect showing you know sort of treating each other equally and the other one is uh, what Shin is highlighting is the the openness of knowledge. I think these are two things perhaps we could give us uh, some uh, inspiration that we treat each other we uh, equally and respect each other and also share knowledge. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Mamti, very much indeed. Professor Chi, would you like to carry on from there because um, Dr. Mamti is talking really here about the kind of evolution of values that allows culture and cultural exchange to make the shift in difficult situations where sometimes yeah. political diplomacy and economic trade can confine and constrict exchange and trust, but somehow culture and literature can do something different. Um, yeah. You have talked about the interest and expertise you have in 
ancient classics. Emily's mentioned it and also Dr. Mamti, how this fascination for the classics um, has been a great spur to learning about each other. Can you say something a bit about the Renaissance and Confucianism today? Because we hear in the West that there is a renewed interest, um, but what is that about? And is there something there that needs to be tapped when we come to dialogue today? Yeah. Uh, you see, uh, well, we can learn much from the predecessors. They have done much, yeah. But uh, what they have done yeah, with the uh, accumulated knowledge, yeah. Uh, they are the modern world that we live in. But uh, uh, we must uh, yeah, uh, acknowledge that there are some limits and misunderstandings in, even in their work. Uh, so we must, uh, we must research and their work and their task must be, I think, uh, uh, be, uh, I think, uh, restudy, you know. Uh, let me uh, share the, yeah, the, the slide. Okay. I, I love the, the translation for Confucius, yeah, the first <laughs> version, uh, because you know the, uh, the accent is ji yu ho ji zha ji. Accent. Uh, uh, Confucius says, learn and continue the practice. Uh, is it not delightful? Yeah, you see the translation. Yeah, and another. 人不知而不愠, 不亦君子乎? No, uh, but the translation, yeah, there's misunderstanding. I think this misunderstanding, yeah, uh, can play, I think, uh, may have uh, some uh, influential, I think uh, may exert uh, influential and not so good, yeah. He say, a man without knowledge and yet without envy, is he not an honorable man? But we know that uh, in, uh, from a, a Chinese uh, standpoint, uh, we, we will not expand this. Uh, we translate, we read this like this. Yeah. Uh, if someone don't understand me, yeah, uh, I will not get angry. And am I a gentleman? <laughs> so we can, uh, yeah, uh, just have Emily has put it. Yeah, the time there, uh, uh, they have a time of uncertainty. And it's very difficult for them to learn Chinese. That even they have someone help them. That uh, the marshman that didn't come to China then uh, for his life. So so he must uh, uh, learn by himself, you know. And uh, the, uh, the dialect, he you know the, the the Mandarin dialect, and just to know the Cantonese. Uh, yeah. And uh, his translation is, is something wrong, I think. Yeah, but uh, uh, we from their work we can see the culture, love, curiosity, and the privilege, and the perseverance. I think. Yeah, and uh, it's a good way. I think uh, uh, we can learn from that to focus on studying the classics. Uh, for we I think we when two people come closer and to uh, know better. I think uh, to know their best values is very important. Yeah, and, and the, the way is uh, recommendable. Yeah, I think uh, the understanding the best values is essential right, to uh, mutual understanding. You know? And you see uh, what they have done that give us a great combination, but uh, after 200 years, we have so many misunderstandings even on the uh, basic values yeah, about the uh, human rights, about uh, the life, about medicine. Yeah, uh, there were many disputes. So uh, I, I think uh, 
they show their per, uh, perseverance. They not only translated the, the only translation, and they dwell on the, in the Sanxi and the uh, Sanxi province uh, for uh, nearly a hundred years and build hospitals and their friends. And you know, uh, last time when I come to the region, uh, someone, yeah, uh, come to pay, uh, see us and uh, take a picture, yeah. His fathers and grandfathers, yeah. And his pictures of uh, Sandong province. And uh, you see the friendship is, yeah, is, is on, on the way, you know. Uh, although they have done so much, uh, I think there's much to do, yeah. And uh, I think the best value is still the foundation our modern world in the near future, right? Yeah, uh, you know. So, Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's what I. <laughs> Emily, would you like to respond to some of the things you've heard from uh, both Dr. Monty and um, and Dr. Chi, Professor Chi? Yeah, I, I think that it's it's really um, interesting what you've both been saying, and I, I think that this is really kind of highlighted as well, the fact that we may all have um, many different uh, cultural beliefs and different core values, but actually we, we share in common the belief that culture is very, very important, that access to cultural institutions and research really unifies us, absolutely. And I think that Professor Chi's um, visit was a really fantastic example of cultural exchange. You know, I learned an awful lot from him. And I think it's it's very, very important going forward that we, we still can continue to work together and learn from each other. I think that COVID has really highlighted um, what's important. And it's also highlighted maybe um, certain weaknesses that we might have had in our system before. The fact that people couldn't access uh, cultural institutions and collections um, during this time which for us all might have been just a temporary blip, but for a lot of people, this is, this is how things are all the time. And I think going forward, we've all got to work together um, to try and make sure that, that as many more people maybe can, can access uh, what they haven't been able to. You know, we've got to have a big discussion about uh, technology, who has access to it and how we're going to use it. Um, so I think that um, absolutely it, it's really interesting just, just uh, talking about um, Confucius and this kind of continuation of cultural exchange definitely between China and, and this country. I have to say as well one of the most important aspects of cultural exchange with Professor Chi was when he taught me how to make tea. That's very important, <laughs> particularly important <laughs> cultural exchange. <laughs> yeah, no, you, you too. I, I really enjoyed that in particular. Um, but yes, going forward, absolutely, sort of building on this, I think there has been a, an enormous interest in um, Confucius and his works in this country generally, you know, um, and, and uh, I think that, yeah, if we just continue to work together and try to overcome all of this uncertainty and emphasise the most important value, which is, again, collaboration as we go forward. Dr. Zunandalua. Um, you mentioned how important uh, Mr. Hyde was in terms of acquiring and promoting Chinese literature. Um, how do you see the Bodleian going forward out of COVID-19 in expanding the access and deepening the engagement between our two cultures to, to go deeper into the classics as well as to move forward into new technologies? Um, very good question, uh, Myra. I think it's that, that we have already we've already started working on digitizing quite a lot of our collections, including our, our 17th century collections too. And I think one of the things that the the collections, apart from the the, the collection itself, the content, it's also there is um, a, the kind of um, the story to tell, which also enriches um, what the the con content I think there's it's a kind of how would you say a, a, a memory um, in in a, a memory of China in 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 the UK and it also has memory of China of China itself some of them are lost and we still have them for example we have um, um, one example is that um, uh, Professor Chi uh, 
showed this map and we have a map which came to Bodleian in 1659 and we still have that on Selden map. It's the only map which has um, charting, you know, the, the navigation map <clears throat> from the, the, the late Ming period and, uh, and I think it's kind of from early 1600s. And we also have um, uh, a book, um, a manuscript which has um, uh, an, an international uh, dimension to it. And uh, for example, that one, the manuscript, it's also um, 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 a sea manual that traveling at sea. Um, it mentions the, the islands, um, which is being disputed between China and Japan. That's the earliest record of it. So we have this rich, um, so, memory of China that we remember and sometimes we forget and we remember it again afterwards when it becomes relevant. So we, moving forward, I think we want to make this um, these forgotten memories to be available to everybody to remember and to put it in the context and, and also the story of how these things, how Bodleian um, worked or collaborated, um, as uh, Emily says, and, and also um, acquired this material and how that promoted intellectual curiosity and the, the so social exchanges. And we still have a lot of scholars coming to look at all these things for with us. And we also, part of my job is also continue this tradition to, to build up and develop these resources and this um, a material so that it serves the future generation. And we have a memory here as a memory institution as Bodley. So that's not... Uh... Thank you very much indeed. It is important to have this living memory that we can keep revisiting the deposit and finding new things and also dismantling some of the caricatures that can happen with history. Um, when I listen to you speaking together as scholars about missionaries, my, my fascination is that missionaries are often kind of put into the corner as um, little objects of colonial use. Um, when in fact, you have presented a picture of missionary scholars who brought insight and innovation um, in terms of cultural exchange. Mm -hmm. So that's a great, a great way, I think, of just kind of calibrating or adjusting again some of our caricatures, at least mine. Um, I want to thank you very much indeed for all that you've contributed to this discussion and to everybody who has joined in and listened to this little cameo of the rich resources of literature and documentation that sits there waiting to be accessed. And in it, maybe some deep surprises about how to live in current times. I want to thank also Dr. Shidong Wang and the Global Prospects Institute for this whole series and hope that you will look out for the next series, which will surely be very soon. Um, thank you very much indeed. And I wish you all a good day. Bye bye.